nice to have you here this morning on this beautiful, beautiful spring day. I don't know about you, but I am so glad that I am alive after Easter. And it is, it's appropriate that our first hymn this morning is Standing on the Promises because it's the promise of Easter that's perhaps the most important promise. So would you please stand and join with us in singing Standing on the Promises. <laughs> Good morning, church. If I haven't met you before, my name is Dusty. I'm the pastor of the church. I'm so glad to have my wife, Debbie, with me today. By the way, I think Debbie is awesome. So let's just give her a round of applause for being so faithful to her husband. Yes, yes, yes. We just want you to know how glad we are to be the pastor of this uh, church family who loves others so well. If you're watching online, you just know that we've been looking forward to being in church with you. I know this is a special day, and so we celebrate whenever we're able to be in the house of the Lord together. Uh, just a couple of family things, because this is home. Um, I don't come to church just because of the teaching or because of the music. I come in part because this is my family. And so I don't know if you know this or not, but uh, Lauren is back there. And Lauren is celebrating her birthday today. Her son Alex is tomorrow. Her husband Bryce is the following day. And so uh, let's just wish her a happy birthday, can we? I can't miss this one because Keith and Lisa are proud to announce the birth of their grandson, born April 9th, Dawson Gary Roebuck. 
uh, 8 pounds 14 ounces. Proud parents Jessica and Jack who watch us online. And so if you're watching with us today, Jessica, we celebrate with you. Congratulations. Let's just wish them um, just how happy we are for them as well. I was thinking about this the other day. All of us need a place where we can be a part of something bigger than ourselves. Uh, something where we can live life together, where the highs and the joys can be celebrated, can be prayed for, can be acknowledged. And I don't know where you are in your life today, but I want you to hear that I've discovered at Federated Church a place where I can be me, being good, being not so good, and still be celebrated in the middle of that. And so I want to, uh, you know, so I want to invite you to that. I know if this is your brand, if this is your first time with us, this might be not be the church that you grew up in, but I think this is a great church, and I want to invite you just to be a part of it. A couple of announcements before we continue, and I give you an opportunity to greet one another. Um, next Saturday, I don't know if you know this or you know or not, but this church grounds is made of about three and a half acres, about three and a half acres, and I believe we have one of the nicest yards in our whole neighborhood. Um, we have green grass, it's watered, the, the trees are gorgeous. We just planted four trees yesterday because we're taking care of this property that God has entrusted to us. And next Saturday, we're going to have a work day, and I need your help. I need your help. Because next Saturday, I think it's at 10 o'clock, we're going to start pulling some weeds. And because this is, this is springtime, I need somebody to help me cut back the rose bushes. And for some of you muscle people, to help put some... Um, we call it bark dust, don't we? Something else. Mulch, to put mulch down. Next Saturday at 10 o'clock, I'm inviting, if you are able to do so, to help us spruce up our yard because we're looking forward to our next big event, and that is the 75th anniversary of Federated Church. And we're going to be celebrating this on the last Sunday of, well, the last Saturday and Sunday of this month. On Saturday night, we're going to be um, having a program where we're going to be sharing some memories over this last year, uh, over these last 75 years of ministry at Federated Church. And we have a great dinner that is going to be catered in. In fact, because we're spending some money on this catered dinner, it's not hot dogs, I'm telling you that. Uh, you need to RSVP if you want a dinner. If you don't RSVP, I'm going to tell you, you're not going to have a dinner unless somebody shares theirs with you. <laughs> and so you did RSVP, and um, there's lots of ways that you can do that. You can look in your um, outline. You can look in your bulletin to find out how you can do that. And then um, on Sunday morning, I'm super excited because all the pastors I called that have been pastors here, most were willing to come back for our 75th anniversary. Um, we're so excited to have Gary and um, his wife. They're going to be giving some memories as well as sharing some um, our welcome with us. We got uh, Pastor Brian Nelson who's coming back to share some memories and to share in communion. We even have Pastor John coming back all the way from Washington in order to give our message for that last Sunday. So we're looking forward to that. And I know that's a lot of announcements, but let's stand and greet those next to you before we get Michael up here to share some songs. Let's find your spot. Before we begin singing here this morning, once again, if you can find your spot. All right, that means you. It's time. <laughs> it's time. Normally we get singing back then, but I hey, hate today. Um, I got, some, I got two good newses for you. Number one, I am not preaching today. Good news, number one. Amen. I know. Come on. 
And good news number two is we have Robin Dykstra, who is, who is, who is with us today. Robin is a sought-after national speaker with the, and a best-selling author. She has over 30 years of teaching people simple ways to take their next step of faith. When she's on the platform, she's teaching other aspiring speakers how to share their story and teach the Bible. I have discovered that Robin is extremely funny. I think you're going to enjoy her message today. But um, before she shares, let's all stand as, as we sing.
message. today. Yeah, I haven't been at church for a little while. I felt lost. Yeah, so do you feel lost when you don't come to church sometimes? As Pastor Dusty was saying, I felt lost because I wasn't with my family. So, well today I want to talk to you about finding Jesus in the darkest places. Can you guys look around the sanctuary? Just up here at the front. And do you see any little Jesuses that look like this? I see two. Okay, go grab one. You want to go grab one? Do you find one? There's one in the audience right there, too. Ollie, there's one behind Madeline, I think. I always see one. Yeah. Do you see the one behind Madeline? Those weren't very dark places, were they? Yeah, but sometimes we're lost and we feel like we're in a dark place. You know who's always there no matter how much light is around? Jesus is always right there. Good job. So these little Jesuses are going to remind you that you always want to have... You always have Jesus in the darkest places. So I'm going to keep mine in my sock drawer. So every morning when I wake up, and I pull my sock drawer out. I remember that even if I'm having a bad day, Jesus is there. You could keep it in your purse, in your pocket, in the car cup holder. So let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for always being there for us, no matter what we're feeling or how we're feeling. And keep it in mind, help us keep in mind that you're always there. Amen. I have about a hundred. Little Jesuses, I'm going to leave it on Servant Central. If anybody else would like one, you're more than welcome. So. Good morning. What a great day to be in the house of the Lord today. It's beautiful outside. Our offering is a commitment of our faith. And you can find two baskets out in the narthex between the doors. One basket is for your regular offering or contribution. And the other is what we call better than a buck because we believe that the dollar in your pocket is better served somewhere else. Well, with Christmas and Easter in the rearview mirror, sometimes it's hard to focus on the promise of God and the promise that he has made to us the rest of the 364 days out of the year. But that promise is evident in scripture all over the Bible, like John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, whosoever, not blacks or whites, not tall or short, not fat or skinny, not gay or straight, not Republican or Democrat, not saint or sinner, but whosoever believeth in him, shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Matthew eleven twenty eight. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. 
God's promise. 1 Peter 2, 24. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Romans 10, 9 through 10. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. My favorite reminder of God's promise is the story of the napkin. This story is best told by Reverend Gary Reif, but I'll do my best to tell it to you today. You see, back in Jesus' day, when people would gather for a meal, if someone got up from the table and they were finished with their meal, they would simply throw their napkin on the table, thus signaling to the servants that they were finished with their meal. However, if they left the table and they neatly folded their napkin and placed it on the, na- on the table, it was a sign that they were coming back. John 20, 6 through 7. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the other linens. This was a sign that God is coming back, and he was simply letting us know that he had folded the napkin and that he would return. I don't know where you are in your faith journey, but to me the promise is clear. The napkin has been folded, signaling he's coming back. And for the rest of my days here on earth, I am whosoever. And I hope that you are too. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, the signs are clear and the the path has been laid out for us in scripture to understand. Believe in you, Lord, and have everlasting life. Please help us to remember your promise and to walk in faith all the days of the year until you bring us home. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. that the first time I came to Federated, I knew that I was home. And how I knew that was that for years, I was a member of the Lutheran Church. Um, And I had left for a while, and I've shared that story before, but I came back, met with Jane, came to Federated, really loved it. But then I was like, I need to go back to Lutheran and see what there is, what I can do. And I went back and I didn't know any of the hymns and I didn't know any of the canticles and I didn't know any of the responsive verses and I felt like a stranger. So I left that service and came to this service and we were singing the song that we're about to sing and I knew every word, and I knew every note, and I knew that Federated was my home. So I just, I felt it was God's way of saying, 
welcome home, and I was asked to share that with you this morning. from John chapter 11, verses 1 to 4. <clears throat> now, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village Mary and his sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord's Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sister said word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When Jesus heard this, Jesus said, The sickness will not end in death. No, if for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. There you go, buddy. That was great. Well, good morning, church. How are you? Glad to be here? I'm glad to be here. We had such a good time yesterday. So today, I need to ask you... Let's see, I need to get my business here. All righty. Okay, so who has had a moment? Not one of those, oh, I'll remember this forever kind of moments, but one of those kind of moments. <laughs> Maybe the computer ate four hours of work and will not spit it back out. Maybe your toddler has done laundry in the toilet and the blankie that keeps it quiet at night is gone, flushed, pew. Maybe the cat knocked over the Christmas tree and shatters all of Grandma's precious heirloom ornaments. I don't know, but when you have a moment like that, it's ugly. I did have a recent moment like that. I'm a professional speaker. I travel all over the United States teaching the Bible, telling my story. 
And I had, I, w- I mean, I was an eyelash from booking a really sweet gig. But we had, and we had, a, we had agreed on the date and the time and the topic, the honorarium, everything was set. So I was kind of surprised when she called me a month later and said, hey, Robin, bad news, two of the board members voted against you. And I went, they voted against me? Why would they vote, ag- why did, did they say why they voted against me? And she said, yeah, they didn't think you were serious enough. <laughs> and I said, oh, okay, well, um, so did, 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 did they say anything else? She said, well, yeah, they thought you were too funny. And I wanted to say, good heavens, this is a women's retreat, not a seminar on the Old Testament prophets, you know? But (laughs) then I said, so I can't come because I'm too much fun. And she said, yeah, exactly. So in that moment, I did what I know to do. I took a breath and I said very graciously, well, I am disappointed, of course, but I'm sure you found someone who will do a beautiful job for you. And she says, oh, we don't have anybody else. We just know we don't want you. (laughs) That's a moment, right? That is a moment. Now, there is a moment that's happening in John 11. And I, I just, I feel like this is so relatable because each of us have moments in our lives too. A moment where you think all things are gonna come together and it's going to work out beautifully, and then it collapses it under the weight of somebody else's decision. You just, it doesn't work out right. And there is a moment where you think, God, are you paying any attention? God, I thought we had this. God, I thought you were for me in this. And we question his timing, and we question his judgment, and we question his goodness. Now, of course, as believers, we know that trials, hardships, and resistance are not always the absence of God's approval. Resistance comes into our lives for any number of reasons. Maybe it's to remind us we're not God. Maybe it's to fortify our faith. Maybe it's to refine our character. Maybe it's to give us fresh opportunities to proclaim God's goodness as as he reveals the why. We didn't get what we wanted. So I do pray fairly often, God, spare me. I do not want any trial or hardship that is that not absolutely necessary for my spiritual growth and development. <laughs> but I still don't love having these moments. Now there is a moment, there is a type of moment that's like, Ugh, but there's also a type of moment that feels more like this. No, 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 no. When you get bad news about your money or your health or a relationship gone south and all you can say is no, 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 no. Well, that's the moment that Mary and Martha are having in John 11. And to set it up real quick, there is two sisters and a brother who live in Bethany, which is about two, hour, two miles from Jerusalem. They are really good friends of Jesus, not just name-dropping friends, not the, yeah, I was at a party with Jesus and 5,000 <laughs> others. No, these are real friends of Jesus. Like, come on over with all your friends. We'll feed you. We'll take care of you really true friends of Jesus. And they are, um, they are having a moment because in John 11, they, you know, they are not entertaining Jesus. There's no party going on because Lazarus is sick. And Lazarus is the covering. He is the protector. He's the provision for this house. And so, as Cody read in verse 3, the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. And I think the wording is so interesting here because as a celebrity, Jesus probably has lots of people who love him. But the sisters don't say the one you, they don't say the one who loves you is sick. They say Jesus, the one you love 
is sick, because that's a whole different conversation. Am I right? When someone says, Robin, the one who loves you is sick, I'm like, aw. But if someone says, Robin, the one you love, your kid, your mama, your friend, your baby, the one you love is sick, that's a whole different conversation. Am I right? We are canceling appointments. We are, re we are calling in reinforcements, prayer teams. We are on airplanes. We are going because the one we love is having a moment. But Jesus doesn't do that. He says in verse 4, when Jesus heard that the one he loved is sick, he said, this sickness will not end in death. Nope, it's for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Verse 5 says, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, so when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. Come on, wait a minute. Lord, the one you love is sick, and you stay where you are for two more days? I just got to ask, doesn't it ever feel to you like God is delaying and it's not, he's not going to make it? He's not going to get there in time. This isn't going to go well because for whatever reason, you have lost his attention. Well, Jesus does come, but in verse 11, it says, On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Say four days. Okay. So when Mary and Martha go out to meet Jesus, they say the same thing to him. In uh, verse 21, Mary sa Martha says it. In verse 32, Mary says it. And here's what they say. Lord, if you had only been here, my brother wouldn't have died. They were probably talking about this for four days. Oh, man, if Jesus was here, he'd send that sickness pecking. That sickness hat can't stand up to Jesus. When he gets here, it's going to be okay. And then Jesus delays. And it's too late. And Lazarus is dead. And nothing comes after dead. Now there's just grief. Now there's just what in the heck. Now there's just questions. God, what happened here? I thought we were on the same page with this. I thought we were on the same page with this new job opportunity, this new pregnancy, this relationship. We question, we question the motives. Well, maybe I'm the only one. Anybody else question, just nod and say yes. Okay. So I ask, and when Jesus gets to Bethany, when he arrives, Mary and Martha's house is full of people again, just chock full of people again, not for a party, but for a wake for a memorial, for a grieving. And uh, Bethany is only two miles away from Jerusalem, and so because Lazarus is sort of a big deal, many, many Jews from Jerusalem have made the trek over to Bethany to comfort, console Mary and Martha and grieve Lazarus' loss. Maybe you've experienced that at a funeral that you're sharing memories and you're, you're talking about, you know, how are we going to go on and who's going who's gonna to pick up the slack where they were. It's just never going to be the same. Everyone is carrying on. They are hot messes. It's awful. There's crying. There is wailing. It's, it's just noisy. But when Jesus comes in to this situation and he sees everybody a mess, Mary weeping, the Jews weeping, He's moved in his spirit, and he says in verse 34, where have you laid him? Just where have you laid him? Because that's what we do, right? When somebody dies or somebody's sick, we get to the hospital and we go, where are they? When we get to the funeral parlor, where, where is he? We just want to say our goodbyes. We just want to have this final closure. Am I the only one? You just want to, where, where is where is he? What, what happened here? And they say, come on, come and see, Lord. And Jesus is weeping. 
I love this Bible verse, Jesus wept. I mean, he, think about this. He knows what's going to happen. And he weeps anyway because he is so intimately connected heart to heart with these people. And their loss, their sorrow, their deep grief is not it, we, is not lost on Jesus. He feels what they feel. He knows what they know. And even though he knows how this story ends, do you know how the story ends? He weeps with them. I don't know about you, but that's really comforting to me that even though Jesus knows the end of the story, that when I'm in the moment, the no, no, no moment, he's with me. And he is experiencing these <laughs> deep sorrows with me. And the Jews, they see Jesus weeping and they say in verse 36, Oh, look how Jesus loved Lazarus. Yeah, Jesus loved Lazarus, but it didn't insulate this family from this awful thing happening. Why? So that they could see the glory of God. News is coming. Now, as they're on their, on their way, Jesus, some of the Jewish people, the, the mourners who come over from Jerusalem, they whisper, I think they whisper, because they're not going to say this out loud in front of Jesus. But in verse 37, they say, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Can't blame him for questioning. Jesus has a reputation for healing. And why didn't he? He loved Lazarus. What happened here? He delayed his arrival. What happened here? I just am giving you permission right now that when you're in your no, oh, no, no moment or your no, no, no moment that Jesus sees you and it's okay to be emotional, upset, fretting. Because I can't be the only one who's buried someone whose life seemed too short. And here's Jesus, the miracle worker, who loved Lazarus, who does nothing yet. The story's not finished, but in the minds of Mary and Martha and Jesus and all his disciples and the guys who come over from Jerusalem, all of them, it's over. Nothing comes after dead. God, don't you love those two words, but God? I do. Say, but God. but God. Yeah, I love those two words. Because God is up to something else. He says God has plans that we don't have any conception about. In this part of the story, the whole crowd, Mary, Martha, D Jesus, his disciples, the mourners from Jerusalem, all of them, they go to the tomb of Lazarus. And it's a cave, verse 39, it's a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. And everyone is standing there. They're crying, they're weeping, they're shaking their heads, they're wringing their hands. This just, how could this be? And I imagine Jesus being part of it, wiping his eye. But then, I imagine Jesus looking around, maybe getting the download from heaven. Maybe this is the moment that he understands what's happening, I don't know. My, his ways are so much higher than my ways. But I am picturing Jesus in the midst of all this wringing of hands and wiping of tears and wailing. I'm just picturing Jesus taking a deep breath. Ready to drag a little heaven down to earth. I imagine him wiping his eyes, squaring his shoulders and saying, Roll away the stone. What? There is no so that at the end of verse 39. It's just roll away the stone. Some translations say take away the stone. There is no take away the stone because you're going to see the glory of God here. There is no roll away the stone because I'm going to raise him from the dead. It's a test. Y'all, it's a test. Roll away the stone, period. End of sentence, lower your voice. Well, Martha jumps in and she goes, but Lord, by this time there is a bad odor. He's been in there for four days. 
And Jesus says, still, no clue, if you roll away the stone, you will see the glory of God. It actually says, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? Now, here's where the story gets really, really interesting. In order to see the glory of God, the heaven come to earth, the miraculous, the, the, all the good stuff that God has for us, in order to see all that, they have to roll away the stone. They have to roll away the stone. When we pray, we get one of four answers. We get yes, we get no, we get not yet, and we get you go first. Because Jesus, who has opened the eyes of the blind and opened the ears of the deaf and has set captives free, certainly has the power to flick open, roll away that stone himself. But he doesn't. He makes them. He makes them. They have to trust him. They have to participate with this request in order to see the miraculous happen. Come on. You see where I'm going with this, don't you? So when, we, when we're in a situation, like this is so huge, let's just say that someone in our, in our midst dies too soon. Your brother, your son, your husband, somebody. It's not the right time. It's not. It's wrong. It's just not the right time. And Pastor Dusty is up here, and he is officiating the, the coffin right here. Closed, dead, nothing comes after dead. And Pastor looks out, and we're all crying and wringing our hands and don't understand why. And at some point, Pastor says, this isn't right. Flip open that lid. I don't know about you, but I am not going to be the first one jumping out of my seat, running down the front. I'm not. But this is the situation that Jesus has put Mary, Martha, his disciples, and all the mourners from Jerusalem in. Flip open the lid. Roll away the stone. And they're like, I don't know about that. Boy, you'd really have to trust that Jesus knew what he was doing, wouldn't you, to roll away the stone? So, doesn't say who, but in verse 41, in anticipation of whatever Jesus is going to do next, they roll away the stone. Doesn't say who. Maybe they all did. I don't know. But now, oh, there is the stink. Goodness, there is the stink. It's important for the stink to be there. Because it proves that Lazarus is dead. He's not just trapped in there. He's not waiting for somebody to rescue him. Jesus doesn't know, oh boy, something went wrong here and he's just, he's trapped. He's not in there taking a nap. He's dead. The stink has two very important roles to play. The stink is there to prove that Lazarus is dead. There's no indication of sin. It's not to, it's not to indicate that Lazarus was so naughty that, oh, there's nothing in the text about that. It's to prove that he's been dead. But it's also there. Who knows there's good and evil? So it's good. It proves that he's dead. But who knows that the enemy is so good at using things against you? It's also there. The stink is there to deter people from opening the tomb. The stink is there to say, oh, you don't want to go there. Whoa. is to keep you doubting instead of acting. But you got to push through the stink to get to the good stuff. you got to roll away the stone and push through the stink to get to the good stuff. Um, I've got a girlfriend who's a speaker, and she is married to a great big Dutch guy. She's Asian, a little bit of a thing, and he is a mountain of a man, He's, we call him Dutch. He wears nothing but plaid. He often wears a cap, you know, one of those plaid cap things. And he is so furry, friends, <laughs> so furry. He's, you know, he's got hair, strawberry blonde hair that's just curly, frizzy, that's coming out from under the cap, coming out of his ears. It's all over his face. It's popping out of his shirt. It's on his arms as the sleeves are rolled up. He is furry. Now, they have a big family. 
They have had several biological children and they have adopted several children. But when my friend um, was about nine and a half months pregnant, it was time to go pick up their last child from China. So my friend could not go. So Dutch had to go by himself. And when the caregivers at the orphanage took little Susie from her crib and put, him, put her in Dutch's arms, Susie started at the button right here, and her eyeballs worked her way up to this fur. And then she worked her way up to this fur. And by the time she got to his sparkly blue eyes, she was screaming bloody murder because this guy didn't look like anybody she had ever seen before. And she could not see how this was going to be a benefit to her. All she saw was the stink, the unfamiliar, the terrifying new. The next thing that God is calling you into might look a lot like a baby being held by a furry Dutch guy. Well, she cried so hard that she threw up and they cleaned her up and she just kept wailing. She could not see that this man would love her, protect her, take care of her, educate her, bring her into a family with mom and dad and brothers and sisters and grandmas and grandpas and cousins, and that she would live in the United States of America where she would be sheltered and cared for. All she could see was this stinky situation. I can tell you, these 10 or 12 years later, that little girl is very happy to live in the United States of America and go to a Christian school and be surrounded by family. But she had to endure the stink in order to get to the good stuff, just like we do. The resistance comes Sometimes to test our faith, sometimes to build our resistance, sometimes just to remind us, I've got you, says the Lord. Okay, so good stuff. Where's the good stuff? Where's the good stuff that's coming? In verse 41, Jesus says, uh, verse 41 says, Jesus looks up to heaven, thanks the Lord for what's to come, and then he calls out in a loud voice, Lazarus! Come out! And the dead man comes out. He doesn't come running out. I just imagine Lazarus in there. Does, did somebody call me? Oh, that's me! And so he kind of wiggles off of the slab because he's all still bound up in his burial clothes. And so he kind of shuffles out in the white. Did somebody call my name? See, Lazarus is now alive, but he's still bound up in his grave clothes. If the stone, scary, too scary to roll away, and the stink is overwhelming, if those don't stop you, sometimes the grave clothes are the next thing that can keep you from experiencing the goodness of God. And I think a lot of us have freedom in Christ. We said yes to Jesus. We want all the good stuff, and yet we're still dragging around, shuffling around in stuff that we aren't supposed to be tied up with anymore. We aren't supposed to live all bound up. A lot of us, I know a lot of women who hide, you can see them. They're handicapped. They're trying to get around in their grave clothes. And you go, do you need some help? And they go, no, no, nothing to see here. I'm fine. <laughs> Lazarus was so alive, but he wasn't experiencing the good stuff. Maybe for you, it's the shame of your before Jesus activities. Maybe it's the regret of, oh, I should have known better circumstances. Maybe it's secret decisions that you still make in the dark, even though you know this does not serve you. Maybe it's bitterness or jealousy. Maybe it's complacency. Like, eh, 
or fear? What if? If the stone and the stink can't stop us, the grave clothes are the next thing that keeps heaven from invading earth on our behalf. And here's the problem. You wear those grave clothes long enough and you start to get used to their limitations. You get used to the restrictions that they have and you just start settling for so much less than God died to give you. And we tell ourselves, yeah, this is, this is, all, I, this is all I want. This is all I need. God, use your resources for someone else more deserving. Friend, he's got plenty of resources. What he gives to me doesn't take anything away from you. Trust me on this. One of my favorite excuses is when I work with women, they say, well, I'm just getting what I deserve. Write this down. You do not have to pay back what is already paid in full. It is done. You can have the good stuff. You can, but how do you get it? Well, Jesus says in verse 44, take off those grave clothes and let him go. See, Lazarus, he needed help getting out of his grave clothes. Can I just tell you today, friend, it's no shame if you have to ask for help. It is not. Maybe to get out of your grave clothes or to get through a stinky situation, you need a helping hand. Maybe you need medicine, or therapy, or prayer support, or coaching, or mentoring. Don't be afraid to ask it. Asking for help is not a sign of weakness. We don't want to be alive in Christ and yet stuck in grave clothes. Because the final, most glorious point to this story is found in verse 45. And it says, therefore Many of the Jews who had come to mourn with Mary and Martha saw what Jesus did and put their faith in him. Woo! Woo! That's good news, yeah? When people watch you push, roll away the stone, push through the stink, get out of those grave clothes, do something scary, try something new, Act on what God is calling you to do so that you can experience the good stuff. Other people watch it. It gives them courage. It fortifies their faith. That's another whole talk. You'll have to come have me back. Sometimes, because they rolled away the stone and pushed through the stink, they saw Lazarus resurrected, and these onlookers put their faith in Jesus. People watch you in a trial, friend. People watch you. When I was about three years old, the ground between my mom and dad shrank and my parents divorced. And it was awful. The relationship with my dad was reduced to Christmas and birthdays. My mom remarried when I was about six, and my biological dad, my birth dad, wanted to give me a fresh start. So when my mom asked him to sign off his parental rights to me so that her new husband could adopt me, he did what he thought was best at the time. And he gave me up. I was adopted by my mom and her new husband, but that marriage lasted about seven months. And by the time I was seven years old, I had already been abandoned, rejected, left behind by two fathers. But my mama, she was a good lover. She loved me ferociously, great cheerleader, a big advocate. She showed me and told me that I was special, loved, accepted. Now, she died when I was only 40, and her death, I mean, such a big hole in my life, as you know if you've lost a mama. And 10 years after she died, I was teaching a Bible study in Ephesians, and we got to Ephesians 6, 2, and 3. And this is what it says. You probably have it memorized, but I'm just going to read it in case somebody's <laughs> new. It says, Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and you may enjoy a long life upon the earth. And it just jumped off the page at me. Just pow, like neon. Like, when did he put that in there? What is that? 
And I didn't know why it jumped out at me. I had always honored my mom. She'd been dead 10 years. It's not like I was trash talking her. And my birth father lived in another state. There wasn't around, much around to honor or dishonor. I had never seen my adopted father since I was seven years old. And I am 50 by this point. And so I'm like, God, what in the world? I don't know what you want. Tell me, what is this thing that you are impressing on me? Because this Bible verse popped off the page. Because, you know... I want a long life, and I do like it to go well with me. So I'm pressing in. I'm pressing in. And there's a still, small voice, and it traipses across the backyard of my brain, and it says, set the record straight. I'm like, I don't know what that means. Set the record straight? What is this? And I really felt like the more I pressed into it, the more I prayed about it, that the Lord wanted me to put my birth father's name back on my birth certificate. That he wanted the records corrected. That the Lord wanted my dad's name back on my birth certificate. And I don't know how to do that, so I googled it. And the only way to revise a birth certificate is through adoption. Did I mention I was 50? I'm married. I've got kids taller than me. I don't even know how this works, so I keep researching. And adult adoption is a thing, y'all. This is a real thing. It was the stone that needed to be rolled away, though, because adult adoption, tedious, laborious, lots of papers, very expensive. And because I was married, all those name changes could affect legal, if I didn't do it right, all the legal documents from high school transcripts up to this point would be corrupt. The paper trail would be, like, fragmented. It was such a big stone. And I thought, okay, I can do hard things, right? We can do hard things. Can you do hard things? Heck yeah, right? I mean... We have passed algebra. We have had children. We know how to drive cars. We can build things. I put together stuff from Ikea. I can do hard things. So I said, okay, it's still a big stone, but I can do it. So I, talk, I kept talking to the clerk at the county, county office, and he says, yeah, is your dad married? And I go, oh, yeah, he is. He got such a good woman this time. They've been married 35 years, and she peels his tomatoes before she slices them and puts them on his sandwich. <laughs> totally loyal, such a good fit. And then the clerk says, well, if your dad is married, his wife is going to have to adopt you too. And I'm like, how crazy pants does this get? First, I gotta ask my dad if he wants me back. Like, that isn't awkward enough. Now I gotta ask for buy in from his wife, too. This, you know, Lord have mercy. This is just, this stone is getting bigger and heavier all the time. And then the clerk says to me, and you know, there's only room for one name in each box on the birth certificate. If you go through with this, and have your dad and his wife adopt you, your birth mother's name will be forever expunged from your permanent record. Can you smell that stink? I am not going to take my mom's name off my birth certificate. I am not. But I want a long life, and I want it to go well with me. So I try talking some sense into the Lord. And I said, I said, Lord, it's just too much. It's too much to ask. It's too expensive. It's too painful. I don't want to do it. You ever do that? Come up against the stone or the stink and go, mm, I don't think so. I started to think things were good enough. I started to think, you know, how important is it really in the big scheme of things? So I said to the Lord, now listen, now listen, God. Names are a big deal to you. You've got so many pages of historical genealogies. 
Why would you have my mother's name taken off my permanent record when I know names are important to you? And he took me to passages about the book of life. And I felt like what the Lord was saying to me was, earthly documents, they have their place, but it's the eternal documents that I keep as the Lord that are really important. And because my mom had received Jesus on her deathbed, her eternal security was secure. And I thought the Lord was saying, it's okay. I've got her. You just do what I ask you to do. And just enough peace came that I thought, all right, let's do this thing. Let's just do this thing. So Dave and I got in the car, or I don't know, I think we went to Florida to go see him. My parents, my dad and his wife live in a trailer park. They call it a resort because some marketing genius figured out you'd rather live in a resort than a trailer park. So they, they were there and we sat down with them and I explained that I would love it if you would take me back. I'm financially secure, I'm potty trained, I'm well behaved. <laughs> Is there any chance that you would be willing to take me back through the process of adoption? And they both said, Robin, we would be honored. Isn't that so good of the Lord to use the same language that got me into this pickle to get me out of it? Robin, we'd be honored. So we go and uh, they fly up to Michigan. We go to the courthouse, and that's a scene out of a circus. There's me and my dad, who's a thousand, and all the little baby, all the little four foster kids with their, with you know their parents and all the babies and me, and we're all waiting to get adopted. And people are looking like, where? What is happening here? <laughs> So we go in and we do the thing and dad says yes and we sign the papers and we walk out of the courtroom and my dad is having a moment he's crying and I say dad what's up are you okay and he says Robin you've always been a nice girl a good girl you've always treated me well and, and respectful but until this moment I never knew you loved me. I thought that what I had done was too much to ask, that it would forfeit any future with you. I just didn't think that, that you loved me. And that just broke my heart. He said, I've always regretted giving up my parental rights, and I just could never forgive myself for being for doing what I thought was, you know, what I thought was the best thing, but obviously was not. And when anybody talked to my dad or my stepmom about Jesus, they, they would say, mm, you don't know what I've done. I'm not worthy of God's love. Nobody could explain to them that when Jesus died, he paid for it all. Not just the little things, but all the things, even the atrocities that you can't forgive yourself for in the moment. That it's done, it is finished, you have a fresh start. But when my dad felt loved by me, I think it triggered a series of domino loves. And he was finally able to receive that if I could love him and forgive him for what he did, that Jesus could too. And I am so excited to tell you that because I rolled away that big stone and pushed through the stink and helped my dad peel off his grave clothes, that both my dad and my new mama received Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior within a year of that adoption. Now that you can clap about. So I don't know where you are today. I don't know what the big stone is that you've been trying to avoid, but I'm going to say, why don't you give that thing a good shove? You just never know what kind of 
heavenly forces invading earth might help you peel it out of the way. And maybe you're facing a big stink, but I'm telling you, you push through that thing, don't give up. The Lord will honor that, and he will make a way for the other side to be so good. You may not be able to see it now, but good stuff is waiting for you, too. And maybe you're stuck in grave clothes. There's that thing, that habit, that obsession that just you're having trouble shaking. Get some help. Get it. Get some help. Take a pill, take a class, take a, take a, a drive, do what you need to do to ask for help to get out of those grave clothes because the Lord is ready with hands full of good stuff for you. And I'm telling you that as you do these things, push through the stink, roll away the stone, push through the stink, peel out of your grave clothes, other people are watching. And as you are successful, they will believe that they could be successful too. And they might say yes to Jesus in a fresh way or in a new way. So Father, we come right into your presence and we say glory, hallelujah, for who you are and all that you have put in our lives. And we know, God, that resistance is hard, but that you would never let anything come into our lives that you didn't first vet. That what comes into our lives as resistances could only be, eventually, for our good or for our benefit. And so we are saying we trust you with what we have to deal with. And we invite you into it to lead us through it. And God, help us have the courage to go for the good stuff that you have for us. Instead of focusing on what is right now, let us set our eyes on Jesus and contend for the good stuff. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless y'all. Stand if you're able and join us as we sing our final hymn, We're Marching to Zion. Before I let you go, we really can um, summarize the whole Christian message in just three big words. Number one, that God wants to justify us, bring us into a relationship with God. And then God wants to continue to sanctify us, that is to make us look more like him. And we can prepare for this glorious day where we, where we will spend eternity with God in heaven. And that's called glorification. So the message of Jesus, though, is don't live that journey alone. Don't live it alone. You need somebody else to live it with you. You need somebody else to model what it looks like to walk with Jesus and to experience the forgiveness of God. One of the things I love about Federated Church is a group of people who will welcome you, invite you into this journey of faith. Once again, if this is your first time with us, so glad that you were here. I hope you'll come back next week as we continue to seek to walk the way of Jesus. Let me just, let me just pray for us now. Father, we thank you for this day. 
We thank you that you're with us. We thank you that you're working in and through us. And God, we're thankful that one day we will spend eternity in heaven with you. But until that day, may we walk hand in hand with other people, other brothers and sisters in Christ from all walks of life, that we can love each other, serve one another, as we can turn to you with our hopes and our frustrations, that we can be encouraged, comforted within the faith family. So, Father, we love you and we trust you this day. In Jesus' name that I pray, amen. We had a whole bunch of pie left over from last night. If you're looking for a piece of pie, it's back in Trimmer Hall. <laughs>